All right, so we're going to talk about telescopes. Why should we discuss about telescopes? Uh, well, let's look at what David Toro said. Okay, maybe I could not say it better than, than that. He said where there is an observatory and a telescope, we expect that any eyes will see new worlds at once. Well, the truth is, as we will see in this course, the telescopes indeed raised to this challenge of new world discovery. And uh, that's true, especially for this one. If you didn't recognize it yet, this is the Hubble Space Telescope, or HST, in case you, you read some of the uh, literature, say, Sky and Telescope or Astronomy Magazine. Um, these telescopes, you know, they don't actually look that impressive, and maybe they shouldn't. After all, uh, what is a telescope? Whether in space, like this one, in space, or on the ground, okay. Uh, they're merely, you know, a couple of mirrors, uh, bare metallic structures. In the case, for example, of the uh, radio telescopes, radio dishes, telescopes, just like your uh, um, cable, um, I guess, yeah, the dish, whatever. Um, yeah, so there are cameras, some stabilizing gyroscopes, especially for the ones in space, uh, obviously some electronics, antennae, all wrapped either in reflective coating, you definitely see it here, uh, and powered by solar panels, again, that's in space, or humongous, rather awkward domes, right? You see? pretty big, right? The telescopes, however, vastly increase our understanding of the universe, which we'll definitely learn about in this course. And um, yeah, we're going to find, we're going to look at some findings that usually make the, the jaws drop, so get a good hold of them. And also, um, we're also going to, um, yeah, they, they're offering us actually a, such an important glimpse of uh, what may lie ahead if we are courageous enough to pursue further our quest for knowledge and if we, say as a nation or even as a whole human race, don't decide that other things may be more important to spend the money on. So the night sky is our greatest glimpse of what lies out there beyond our world in the expanse of space we know is universe, uh, but we're not bound by the limits of our eyes any longer. So what do we see with our eyes? You kind of, you can count them, right? It's, it's merely a few thousand stars. You can, you can see that, you can see the moon, uh, you see just five planets, not even all of the planets that uh, orbit the sun, uh, and you can see the Milky Way and some other, let's call them fuzzballs, which you know, sometimes are just, just clouds, uh, just clusters of stars of millions, billions of stars, or, or galaxies of hundreds of billions of stars and other things. So uh, here on Earth, right, uh, we've been building telescopes and using them for about, uh, about 400 years. Used, build and used telescopes. And initially, uh, you know, they were used to hunt for comets or for exciting features on the planets, such as moons, rings, atmospheres. But it wasn't long before we discovered that there is a whole, well, universe out there for us to discover. So, what are the telescopes? They're basically giant eyes. We're gathering a lot more light with these telescopes than uh, what our lens, the crystalline, I guess, the, the eyes are able to to do it. How do they do that? How do they work? Well, it's, it's all because of this physical phenomenon called refraction. 
okay? which is basically the bending of light when it passes from one substance into another, like, for example, uh, light coming in this direction from the Earth. It meets this in, um, separation surface between the air and the glass, and it's going to change direction, right? So it doesn't go like this. <coughs> Excuse me, it goes like that, and then part of it is actually reflected. And this is the refracted component. So, light coming from far away. and the lens is able to bring it to focus. And all happens because of the refraction. In case you didn't know, uh, the refraction causes these beautiful sunsets or sunrise. So it's refraction of sunlight Uh, by, what do you think the lens is here? It says here, Earth's atmosphere is, uh, say, molecules like water in the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, so at the sunrise and the sunset, the um, sun is barely above the horizon, so the light goes through a lot of atmosphere before it arrives at us. Okay, so now how about the, the uh, creation of the images, right? So the light bends as it changes the medium, right? So it goes from air, glass, and then air again, right? But of course the shape of whatever changes bends the light is going to be important. So here is just a slab, a flat glass, and this is going to be um, the curved lens, okay? And you see the uh, final effect is going to be different, right? So this, uh, it's never, the light is never focused. Well, here you get all the light coming together in one point, and that point is called the focus, or focal point. And um, just for kicks, as we're going to use it in a second, the uh, distance between the lens and the focus, that is the focal length. Right, so if light is hitting the, if light hitting the lens is parallel, then the light bends, um, the lens bends the light towards a single focal point, right? So you see, even though the light is actually emitted in all directions, this is you know, our line of sight. And at some point, these rays are going to be parallel. And if they come parallel into the lens, then they're going to focus in one point and form the image. And then you'd say, well, great, that is uh, what's happening if you have a star, for example. But what if you have not one or one, one point, right? So it's one point or point source. Of light, right? This is actually an extended source of light. It's not a point, right? It's more than one point. Well, here's what happens. Each point, each spot, it's going for each spot is going to be created an image, right? So that one, for this one, for example, right? You're gonna get this image and then say another one here that is going to be created here and so on, right? So each spot creates a separate image and that's how you get to image the whole extended source of light. Okay, 
here is uh, schematically uh, how a very simple refracting telescope looks like. That's actually uh, the type that Galileo's telescope looked like. So what do you have here? Uh, a very large diameter objective lens, all right? Because you need to gather, right? Gather light from out there. And then a small eyepiece, all right? So that's gonna be eyepiece. This is small. You don't need it big, and actually, you, you might f have figured it out, the larger the lens is, the larger the focal length is. So, you probably want something big to gather a lot of light, and then you focus it, and then you get that uh, all that gathered light with the eyepiece to create that impression that all that light is coming from infinity from very far away and so your eye will process it right so this is another lens that is going to focus it on on the retina so this is how it works if you want to put a number say on how good your telescope is then you come up with these fractions it's basically um, the focal length of the objective lens all right, so it's this one, divide by this distance. And that is going to tell you how good your telescope is, how much of a magnification is produced by your telescope. Now, it's not only the magnification. Um, I, uh, let me tell you, there are actually two more most important properties of a telescope. And one is the light collective, collecting area. So basically how much light we're actually capable of gathering with our telescope. Okay, because that means, right, so we have large collecting area, that means more information. The more light we gather, the more information we're going to get, right? So greater amount of light in a shorter time, it's only going to be uh, obtained with a bigger telescope, right? Bigger is always better, especially for astronomy. So the area, some of you know it as pi r squared, but of course radius is half of the diameter. So you end up with a formula like this pi d over 2 squared. And it's important to keep it in terms of the diameter because the diameter is actually in the name of a telescope. You probably heard, oh, this is a 10-inch telescope or this is a 10-meter telescope or a 5-meter or 2.5 or whatever, right? So all that, that, those numbers are in the name of the telescope, right? So this is diameter and it's important because it goes in the name of the telescope. The name of the or the type, right? It's just it characterizes the type of telescope you're using. All right. So that was the an, a very important property of a telescope. It's going to basically tell you how much information you actually going you're going to obtain with with your telescope. The other one is basically how sharp is the image, or how sharp is the information that you're going to get with the telescope. And that is given by the resolution and it is going to be angular because that resolution right it's telling you well how much detail am i going to obtain and that is only always going to be angular right so you're looking at the sky and you're going to see a, an angular separation right just how far away are two sources away uh, away from one another basically what are the chances that you're going to see two things that are close to one another is separate things, okay? So, uh, so as it says here, the angular separation is the minimum angular separation that the telescope can distinguish, okay? 
so now the angular resolution, so that angle, let's say theta, as we will see in a second, right? That depends a lot. That is a function of basically the diameter of the telescope, just how large the objective is. And it says here, telescopes that are larger have uh, great are capable of taking images with greater details, so better accuracy or resolution, better angular resolution. Okay, so basically, better resolution that means smaller theta, right? The smaller uh, distance, angular separation, angular distance between two things that you can still see as separate. Now, the ultimate limit to the resolution comes actually from interference of light waves within the telescope. And actually, that says theta is also a function of the wavelength, the type of light, right? Wavelength, remember? Or the characterization of the type of light detect it and measure by the telescope. And here is the formula that puts it all together. So this is the angular resolution in arc second. So we have angular resolution and it's going to be given by this equation and that says hey the the larger the wavelength the larger the angular resolution is right or basically the larger separation so that means lower resolution the image is not that sharp But if you build this telescope with, as you know, with very large objective, right? So you have large diameter. That means smaller separation, good or better resolution. So what you want from your telescopes, right? So want large D and small wavelength, right? But that's, you know, not necessarily, uh, you know, a choice you want to make because you want to observe, right? So, uh, we need to observe the sky of the universe uh, at all the wavelengths okay so it's important to know about this dependence but there is you know not really much we can do about it in terms of hey how are we going to build our telescope to have that great resolution that we need we need to adjust the size of the telescope right so for uh, large wavelengths for example in radio we're gonna need huge diameters in order to obtain a you know, reasonably good resolution for our images. All right, so we just discussed now about the angular resolution and there is the word diffraction here, it's related to the interference um, and it's, you know, if we're not gonna go into detail of that, but this is uh, the phenomenon that, uh, you know, helps us come up with these formulas. Formula is very useful, we're just not going to derive it or explain where it's coming from. We did explain what it means. And uh, there's another thing uh, that limits, another limit
for good angular resolution is basically the atmosphere, actually the turbulence in the atmosphere or uh, the way the molecules move or dance in the atmosphere. Because they're going to move and they're going to emit those photons and they're going to scatter them. And so instead of seeing you know, one point, right, because the light is scattered, you're going to be seeing a blob. Right? So this is a star or a point source becomes a blob. We're going to talk about how uh, we got around this situation as well. Um, we didn't talk about these images, so here's what happens here. We're seeing, uh, say, a, a, a binary system, binary star, so we had two sources of light with angular separation that is actually greater right, than the angular separation of the telescope. So basically the telescope is able to see them as uh, two separate things, all right? So the sources can be distinguished. However, right, so this is, um, so what do we have here? Theta for the telescope is actually smaller than the angular separation. Okay, so we have good resolution for our telescope, but in this case, okay, the angular separation So basically, just how far away are those two stars from one another uh, equals the um, angular resolution of the telescope. And so in this case, right, it's barely possible to tell that there are actually two sources. Okay? Here are some examples of uh, how we, you can apply what we discussed so far. So say we have this question. You might find some others on the Mastering Astronomy uh, homework. So we have um, the question, uh, how does the collecting area of a 10 meter telescope, right? So this is basically diameter one, that is 10 meter. How does the collecting area of a 10 meter telescope compare with that of a two meter telescope. So this is the second telescope, the diameter is two meter. The question is about the collecting area. Remember the area? That is pi r squared or pi d over two squared. You can always write this as pi d squared over four. So let's compare areas of the two telescopes. So we have area one divided by area two. So we take ratio. Ratios are best friend of a scientist. What's going to happen? So you're going to have pi d1 squared over 4, and then for area 2 is going to be pi d2 squared over 4. And here's what happens when you have eight ratios, things are going to cancel like this pi and this 4, and you end up with d1 squared over d2 squared. And here's another trick if you want, you can do d1 over d2 all squared. It's just easier to do the calculations. Of course, you can do the squares first and after that the ratio, right? So what do we have? D1 is 10 meter, D2 is 2 meter, and we have that squared, and that's going to be 5 squared. It's going to be 25. It looks like we found our answer, right? So uh, here is you know some hint as to how you're going to compare two telescopes. You basically take the ratios of their diameters and you square it. 
and you get the answer. Here's another question. We have here uh, two stars separated in the sky by 0.1 arc seconds. So this is star one, star two, and we're looking at them. Of course, this is highly exaggerated. This is a very high angle, so this is not going to be 0.1 arc second. 0.1 arc second is a really tiny, tiny angle. Okay, so we look at them with a telescope that has an angular resolution of 0.5 arc second. Okay, so basically our pixel is five times larger, right? This is the size of the pixel in the CCD camera, right? Basically the resolution and that is five times larger than the separation. Basically you cannot see anything, any detail, right? So can't see any detail. It's just one dot in your camera. What will you see? Well, I already told you. You're not going to see, be able to see the two distinct stars, right? They are blended together, okay? They are not going to appear to be touching because this is much, much uh, larger. So, no, it's not going to look like a, a dumbbell. If, if the resolution, if this would have been 0.1, then dumbbell situation. But this is much, much larger, actually five times larger, right? So it's not that you're going to be, uh, not going to be able to see anything at all, but you are going to be able to see one point of light that is the blurred image of those two stars that are 0.1 arc second away from one another. All right, so this is what you expect to see with the telescopes, but um, what kind of telescope exists out there? What kind of telescopes we as human beings built so far? There are basically two designs that people looked into, and uh, one is the refracting telescope, and this is a keyword, the uh, the lenses are used, right? So this looks very much like the telescope we already uh, talked about, like the one that Galileo Galilei first used to look at the sky. And so remember I told you the larger the objective, the better the telescope, but if this objective lens is larger, then the focal lens needs to be larger as well. And so you end up with a very big structure and long. And it needs to point up, right? Look at that. And guess what? Gravity always works. And so things are going to sag. Yeah, so um, very long, very large, obviously heavy, so not very feasible, not very efficient use of funds of, you know, over time, uh, just think of it, okay. Also, you know, because, for example, there are, remember that uh, diffraction, right, through a lens, so you have the, the red part of the light is refracted at a certain angle, but then the blue one seems to be refracted. I'm exaggerating here, but you, you get kind of different points and you want them to be at the same points. That's what we mean by 
the chromatic aberration, so we need to correct, needs to be corrected, okay? There are aberrations that need to be taken into consideration. Of course, we can do that, it's just, you know, some more bothering issues we need to take care of. Um, and so people moved to a different kind of design, and that design is the re Reflecting telescope, obviously, so not now we're not working with lenses anymore, we work with mirrors, and they're great because reflecting telescopes uh, they can be built much, much larger, okay, with much greater diameters. You remember, the higher the larger the diameter, the larger the collecting area, and therefore, better images, higher resolution, everything we actually want from the telescopes and also also because the light do not, does not move through a phase change doesn't go through the glass and then again through the air uh, we're not going to have to deal with those chromatic aberrations we just talked about um, interestingly there are many designs possible uh, for example we have the uh, casa grain focus the names are from people who actually build them and where you see this secondary mirror um, that sends light back through a hole in the primary mirror. Uh, and so it focuses somewhere here. So the focus is uh, where you put the detectors, instruments, filters, anything that you need to obtain the image or the data that you need. Um, also, there is the Newtonian focus, obviously Newton came up with that, where the secondary mirror uh, sends light back through a hole, um, kind of redirects, um, re redirects the, the focal point to the side, right? you see, it's here, uh, so it offers the advantage that there is no hole in the primary mirror, but you still need to build a structure to uh, kind of put all the equipment somewhere high above the ground. Um, or uh, then there is the Kude or Nassim, Nasmit uh, focus where you uh, come up with a tertiary mirror. And then you end up with the focus a little lower. So yeah, these are some ideas, and this is an example of the. Uh, this is the cast grain focus type of a telescope. This is called a Gemini North. That is on uh, top of Mauna Kea. I'm gonna show you actually that side in a second. So this is the primary mirror. You see that's basically eight meter in diameter. This is primary mirror. And then the secondary mirror, actually this is the image of secondary mirror, which is here somewhere. Yeah, nice. Here are some more examples uh, of reflecting telescopes. These are the twins, uh, Keck telescopes, each of 10 meter in diameter. So basically, this is the honeycomb. You see, there are uh, segments, right? There is a segmented 10 meter mirror, it was assembled uh, on top of the mountain, on the side, so it was not, you know, that 10 meter mirror, so that, you know, that would be 10 meter in diameter, okay? So it's a very, very clever way of putting together such a huge mirror, and that is here, right? So basically, this is the thing, and this is a person for scale. No, he's not a scale. This is uh, actually your instructor, that's me on top of Mauna Kea. This is where the 
Keck Observatory is. So those are the twins. The Keck, the twin Keck telescopes. And I'll show you where I was standing to see in a those, I think I was uh, somewhere here on this platform and I was having in my back those, the twins, the twin kick, 10 meter telescope. And the Gemini North, remember, talked about that, that is under this dome. All right, so this is Mauna Kea in Hawaii, in Big Island. So if you get a chance to go see, visit that island, uh, you can probably take you know, an afternoon off from the beach and go visit the site because it's visitable. People go there and uh, can take a tour of the telescopes. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's not just the Gemini or the Keck. There are actually quite a few um, telescopes there. It's a really good site. Uh, the site has been in the news for quite a, some important conflict. Uh, between the native Hawaiians and the astronomers. The astronomers learn how to uh, be more polite and talk about their science with the, with the native people who, uh, you know, they didn't like very much that their sacred mountain was kind of taken over by other kinds of people. So, uh, yeah, just learning how to communicate, you know, it's very important. We're, we're trying very hard. Uh, there are some, um, you see here, sub-millimeter, right? So this is a radio telescope. So not just optical, right? Uh, there are some small ones, right? So this is a tiny, small, compared to 0.6 meter with, remember, those are, again, 10 meter telescopes. Those are huge. Uh, I think the Gemini is an 8 meter, right? We, took, we, we looked at that before. All right, so quite a few telescopes there. Go see if you get a chance. Uh, this is uh, another example. This is the Mount Palomar. This is a 200-inch prime focus uh, cage, right? So basically we have the, uh, the primary mirror that's in the background. Uh, it's very dark, so the secondary mirror is installed in this cage. So this is where secondary mirror is, and this is a person in that cage for scale. Interesting, isn't it? Nice image. Okay, so we now have a well-focused telescope. Now what? What do we do with it? Okay. Well, there are so many things we do with them, and that, that's why we actually build the instruments, right? So we have photometers, cameras, spectrographs. These are usually uh, falling under the umbrella of instruments. And those are, you know, in the final focus, right? This is where you put your detectors, right? So... Uh, we can measure the number of photons, basically how to uh, find out to so measure intensity of light. Basically, you can measure how much more intense or less intense one object is relative to the other. Uh, or you can actually create an image, right? You can use filters. You can just say, okay, I want to know how much intense is the light, for example, in the, if this is wavelength, this is going to be, say, the red part of the spectrum and the blue part of the spectrum and the kind of yellow, green, right? And you want to find out, you measure the intensity here and then intensity here and then intensity here. Oh, you know, then you're going to fit it maybe with a black body curve and find out, you know, many things about that star that emitted, for example, that light. You're going to find out its temperature or how fast it's moving if you're looking at the absorption features or, or other things here, right? So this is how, how it's working. So filters are... Uh, very, uh, very important, right? Because you're going to get, oh, you know, instead of having 
the whole light, right? Like the whole intensity of light that's coming from that side, you can say, oh, I can basically find out how the blue part of the emission compares to the red part of the emission and, and so on. And that's going to give me a lot more information about what kind of source of light is that. Again, what's the temperature, is the, what, how fast is moving and so on, right? Uh, and so how fast is moving that you get it from, uh, say, some absorption features or lines and you get them with the spectrographs, right? Because they're able to stretch the light into its components, split light into components with the desired resolution. And nowadays, yeah, we do it with the uh, charge couple devices or the CCDs as opposed to in the past were photographic plates or other things. Okay, um, so we gather say the intensity in different filters uh, and we can put them together and obtain nice images, right? So for example, here is a nebula, okay? This is how it looks with uh, the red filters basically telling us where inside that nebula is light that is emitted at that particular kind of lower temperature, right? So red, that is longer wavelength, that is lower temperature, remember, talked about that, and this is like, hey, uh, find out or localize uh, those hot photons, right? So shorter or blue photons or light, that means hotter temperature, right? And so you combine them, and you obtain a composite image that, as you can see, tells us a lot about you know what happens inside that cloud of gas. Where where it is hotter, where it is colder, and uh, stuff like that. And then you have spectroscopy, which, okay, we're breaking all that light into its components, right? So basically, this is the wavelength. We find out the intensity at each wavelength, right? So, of course, it's kind of like that, right, for lower spectral resolution. But then, same thing, you can do it at much smaller, uh, much higher resolution, so you can basically are able to measure the intensity much uh, smaller delta lambda or for ma as many wavelengths as possible, sharper uh, definition of the intensity for each tiny uh, measurement of the, of the wavelength, right? So you get much more detail for intensity as a function of wavelength. All right, so again, that's going to tell us a lot about, say, uh, composition, right? Because we have the fingerprints, we're gonna find out how much hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and so on exists in, for example, that cloud of gas, right? Or star, or so on. And then uh, another thing is timing, right? So we can take snapshots, or basically measure the brightness or intensity on the y-axis as a function of time, okay? To so say, okay, every, we find out, for example, in this uh, case, we find out, for example, how uh, light coming from a certain source varies with time, right? There is uh, fluctuation in the intensity. In this case, there is actually even a periodicity of about a few hundred days. So, yeah, interesting things. Like, uh, for example, for uh, uh, orbiting things, right? Because some things will, will be um, eclipsed, right? Say a binary system, right? You go one star coming in front of the others, it's going to be, you know, eclipsed. So maybe a minimum, for example, or maybe you have or uh, pulsating star that swallows and it's going to be 
bigger and therefore more luminous, but then it shrinks. So, you know, you learn about all these things by doing timing, right? Just measuring how, measuring the brightness or the intensity as a function of time. And maybe a final note on the fact that, yes, we do imaging or measurements of light, but not only uh, invisible. This is, for example, uh, an X-ray image. Image of, I think it's a... Uh, um, supernova remnant. We'll talk about that later on. But the thing is, right, you, 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 you find this, so it says image, and in, if you read in, I don't know, even New York Times, an article about some discovery in astronomy, and it says um, false color. All right. Well, the thing is, there's nothing actually false about it in, in, in the basic sense of it. So, not really false. It's just that's not seen by our own eye, right? So, remember how we have the spectrum, right? So, you have visible here. And this is going to be where the red part is. This is uh, going to be where the blue part is, right? And so this is longer wavelength, this is shorter wavelength, but you can do the same kind of game for the part that has the x-rays, right? So this is gonna be longer wavelength x-rays, these are going to be shorter x-rays. So basically this is going to be bluer x-rays and this is going to be the redder part of the x-ray. So we assign uh, the colors that we get to see you know in in the visible right you kind of transfer them to any other part of the electromagnetic spectrum and that's how you get that false color, which is actually not false, it's just telling you that, hey, the, the ones that look redder, they're the lowest energy, right, or longest x-ray wavelength, and the blue ones, they're going to be the highest energy or the shorter, uh, the shorter wavelength. So yeah, that's about it.